Okay, where we left off last time, we'd created a single interaction client server. So here we have a socket connecting to the server. We ask the socket for an input stream, which is how the server communicates with us. We have the input stream read a line from the server. We display it to the user, and then everything's done. So it is not interactive. The client can't send information to the server and then get replies. Because, in the video before that, we'd said that there was a problem involved here. We want to do something like this in the client. We want to like, be waiting for the user to type things at the keyboard. Whatever the user types at the keyboard, we want to send to the server. Then we wait for the server to send us back a reply, and we display that out to the user. The problem here was that both of these read lines are blocking operations, which means that while we're waiting for the user to type something at the keyboard, we can't also be listening for the server to send us something and displaying the output, um, which would be a huge problem for a text game because while the user is like sitting there waiting for things to happen, you know, chickens could be running into the room and, and attacking you. So uh, let's try and fix this problem today by using thread. If you don't know what a thread is, a thread is a kind of parallel execution path through your program. So you can have multiple parts of your program running at the same time. The plan in this video is to walk you through some of the ideas involved in creating your own threads. Um, and we'll write a simple program not having to do with clients and servers that just make you feel comfortable creating several threads that run at the same time. Then we'll end the day by creating another client server pair, but in this case, it'll be interactive instead of single interaction. So let's start here. I've made a class called my threaded class, and the most important part of my threaded class is this method called run, which loops from zero to some maximum, and just has a print statement, which prints the unique ID that got set by the uh, class's constructor, and then what loop iteration it's on. I'll explain more about what this is all doing in just a second, but I wanted to point out that here I'm constructing my threaded class with four different IDs, A, B, C, and D. So back here in my threaded class, that's the input to my constructor, and I see that I'm setting my ID. So each of my threaded class objects should run this same run method, but they're gonna display different IDs, depending on which class is running. Did I say which class is running? Sorry, which object is running. So even though you don't know how this works yet, what I wanted you to notice is here I've got thread one start, thread two start, thread three start, thread four start, and thread one, two, three, and four are new threads that are gonna be running the run method from my threaded class. So if this was running the way that Java ordinarily runs things, this would run until it was completely finished, and then the next one would run until it was completely finished, and so on. If I run it, you'll see that it's a whole mix so if I stop it here and scroll up, you see B is running, and C is running, and D is running, and A is running further up there. So all of these, all of these threads are running kind of in parallel to each other. Actually, they are running kind of one step at a time. It's just that uh, each loop iteration, uh, or the loop iterations are kind of being interspersed with each other because the computer is simulating running these four different things at the same time. Okay, so what's going on? What's going on here is the interface called runnable. Um, a runnable interface defines a class that has a special method called run, which can be run on its own independent thread. So whenever you want code to run separately from your other code on its own thread, you have to have something that implements the runnable interface. Um, so here I've, and there's lots of different ways to do this, but here I've chosen to actually have my class implement that interface directly. Once you have a class that, interf uh, that implements the interface, here you can create a new thread object and you can hand it any object that implement, any object whose class implements the runnable interface. You might be wondering what is this start method? The start method does several things, but the main thing that from your user perspective that you want to understand is that what start does is it will run the run method that's the one that you've implemented from the runnable interface. Okay, having said that, you will probably never actually want to construct your own threads this way and run them. Um, I just wanted to show you kind of what that was doing. A better approach is to use something called a thread pool. The idea here is you can have this object create for you a whole bunch of threads, however many you want, 
Um, in this case, I'm creating four threads. And then you can ask the thread pool object to execute your various runnable objects for you. And what it does is internally, it has all of these various thread objects that it's created. And so it will associate your runnable object with one of those threads and run it for you. Um, the reason that this is better is, as you're gonna see later on, um, when we're gonna have a server that can handle multiple clients, every single time a new client connects, we're gonna need a new thread to handle the interactions with that client. And potentially, we wanna do uh, several things. We wanna limit the number of clients that can connect to us at a time. Um, if we have lots of clients connecting and disconnecting all the time, we're gonna use up a lot of, uh, a lot of time creating and destroying all of those objects. So uh, what the executor service is doing for us is it's managing all of those threads for us. So rather than creating and destroying objects, we're just reusing the same pool of objects. As you can see though, um, from, using perspective, from a user perspective, it's still pretty straightforward. Um, I instantiate my threaded class. I'm saving it into a runnable data type because my threaded class does implement the runnable interface. I create a new executor service um, using this special kind of factory method. And then it's called pool. And every time I want to execute a new thread, I tell the pool to please execute. And then I hand it a different runnable object. And then at the end, I shut them all down. So why don't you go ahead now and try and program these same classes and make sure that you can see them all go. Um, a nice experiment as well would be to limit the number of threads in our pool to two and see what happens compared to four. There's one thing I wanna end with uh, before going to the client server code, which is you sometimes see this sort of thing. You see new thread and new runnable and what's weird is you got a code block here that seems to be actually implementing a run method, um, but it seems like it's inside like the, the constructor somehow. I don't know, you, if you've never seen this before, this is a weird construction. And so I wanna to explain to you what's going on in this construction, because you actually see this kind of thing uh, a whole lot when you're working with GUIs. So going backwards, here's what we just said. Um, I have this threaded class, which implements the runnable interface. The way that we actually run it is we create a new thread object and you hand it the runnable object as an input and then you tell the thread object to start. Okay, so, you know, collapsing it a little bit, here's the idea, we're creating the new thread and then whatever the input here has to be a runnable object. Well, instead of actually creating, a, instead of actually instantiating a runnable object, there's something called the interface initializer, which lets you do this. Runnable was the name of the interface. So I can do something that looks like running a constructor. I'm saying new runnable. Um, I'm not actually running a constructor, but it kind of looks that way. But then instead of just uh, ending it there, I actually open a code block and I can implement the, uh, the method in the interface right here, right now. So this is all the code that I want for run. So you can think about this as like creating a new class, but one that doesn't have a name and that you just create right here. So the output of this is going to be an object that implements the runnable interface. And what happens when you run it is this method. But you didn't have to go to all the trouble of creating a new file and actually declaring a class. So putting that together with the other stuff, I could take that same construction and I could now assign the output of that to a runnable data type variable called mine, and then the rest of it's the same. I could hand mine to the thread and then tell the thread to start. So that's kind of the same as before. Okay, so let's keep going now. What if I don't actually create the runnable variable? Instead of actually saving the output from this runnable call into a variable and then putting the variable as an input to thread, I can say let's make a new thread and then this opening parenthesis closes here. And as you can see, everything in between is the code that's generating that object that implements the runnable interface. So basically all I'm doing is I'm nesting things inside of other things. So let's look at it one more time. It's this line right here where I'm saying new thread mine. You ask, what is mine? Mine is the output from this code. So rather than save the output from this code into a variable, let's just place this code directly as the input to the thread constructor, like that. 
Okay, but now we can do even one step further. Rather than saving the thread object into a thread variable, why not, because all we're going to do with it really is just run the start method, why not run the start method directly at the end of all of this? And that looks like this. So I'm saying let's create a new thread. The input to that thread is going to be a new runnable object. What happens when that object runs the run method is this. And then once all of that has been constructed, I'm going to run the start method here at the very end. So if you understand kind of what each piece is doing, it's actually pretty sensible. But if you see it for the first time just like this, it seems like some kind of crazy chaos. Okay, I'm going to split the video off here and we'll start a second video that actually does the client server code using the